Hello everyone, this is Oral Sociology and I am so glad you're in this class. This is the instructor lecture and each week I will give you a short overview of uh, some of the concepts that we'll be learning and expect you to use them in the discussion board and do some reflection with them in regards to um, also the videos that you're watching that are loaded like the TED Talks and also if you'd like to incorporate it up of course in the reading and the flip grids. Um, all right, what is rural sociology? The best way I get at rural sociology or any other topic is through quotes of people who actually have worked with it. <laughs> I have uh, been uh, raised in suburban areas. I study a lot of rural regions because of my uh, dissertation topic and um, yay, I'm gonna be assistant professor this fall. I'm excited about that um, at Emporia State and I'm defending my dissertation in uh, July and so at K-State, so all things are, are looking good there. But part of my world is studying uh, religion in rural uh, society. Um, and I have taken several courses on rural development and uh, feel really uh, compelled that in our world as we live today that we often skip and overlook this very important part of life. So let's start with a couple quotes to help us to understand what is rural sociology and rural community. First, quote is A.R. Desai, who is an Indian sociologist, and I mean from India, sociologist, uh, that taught at the University of Bombay and was head of the department in the 60s. And he says that the prime objective of rural sociology should be to make a scientific, systematic, comprehensive study of the rural social organization of its structure, functions, and objective ten tendencies of development on the basis of such study to discover the laws of development. So a large portion of this is about development and not just development in the United States. We tend to see pictures of rural life only from the places that we have been raised. That can be in our own state, that can be in our own region. And it's important, just think about the difference of rural life in the Kansas Nebraska region versus Louisiana or Florida. Think about it in Mexico. Think about it in Thailand. Uh, all kinds of rural societies exist in different ways, often based on the labor of the land and sometimes based on the labor of things like mining and uh, all the materials that help us to make things in the larger urban centers into beautiful things like phones and even books because trees go into paper and all of this stuff is connected often to rural communities. So the first point I wanna make is that rural life exists globally. It is not something that we just see in the US. Dwight Sanderson was a rural sociologist who was actually an intersection of entomology, sociology, and farming and agriculture, working for the US Department of Labor in the early 1900s. Now, studying rural sociology in those days prior to World War I and II looked very different than it does today. Dwight Sanderson brought up the sense that sociology is life in the rural environment, and that would often entail the social issues that go along with farming, ranching, and at the time, not so much of a globalized experience as more nationalized. For example, if we had drought in the region, sociologists would often go and study how life adapted and structures adapted, and what were the needs to address the social problems. Now, when we look at sociology and rural sociology, we think about global indications of the environment, global indications of uh, cheap labor and how it affects communities and how that interconnection, because we have globalized beyond nation states with corporations and sometimes super uh, corporations that uh, are the larger connection to community than sometimes people feel to their own countries or regions. And so it's very different, but he still has a very important point that we study the rural life, what's going on. So the next point I want to make is that rural life exists in an environment different from, but not fully unlike urban and suburban life because we're globalized now. And even though prior to World War I, we didn't see people connected in the same way, 
Ever since we've started to mine 10 and be able to put together most of the motherboards and things for computers and things, we are now more connected and there are a lot of things that bring us together that are alike than things that are not so much. So it's, it's a, a unique setting as we study rural sociology right now. F.S. Chapin was a sociologist who was also an environmentalist and he studied the sociology of rural life as a rural population type of understanding the demographics, population, organization, social processes. And especially after World War uh, one and two, we started to see those populations have to live in conjunction and in, up and against urban cities. Now they've always been there, but sometimes communities were able to self-sustain. Maybe they were leaving uh, other parts of the world because of oppression and starting communities uh, that may have had more connection with a region than they did with a nation state. Maybe communities uh, came to life because the railroad or some sort of transportation technology developed and went through those areas. And so the population changed based on that. Um, sometimes our rural life uh, is up and against uh, suburban encroachment and um, sometimes urban encroachment. And so we see a lot of our towns that used to be rural uh, still having to organize and try to uh, present themselves in their own identity as rural, even though the rest of uh, their life is affected by people moving further and further away from urban centers. So there's lots of ways in which that uh, study of population, study of the way in which that process of life changing uh, is something we want to compare, and it is comparative in measurements. We study over time uh, how communities develop, and so a town that might have been smaller at one time may have grown, and that might have affected their rural identity, even though agriculture or farming or whatever sustained them might still be uh, the corner of their labor. Uh, other types of environments like culture or being connected to commutes to the city or more jobs might be something that has altered that community. In the uh, converse of that, uh, many communities are shrinking and that were larger at one time, maybe even parts of county seats, um, because they are not near an urban center or not near transportation areas or well-kept roads so that they cannot uh, sustain the life that they had before. And there's a lot of um, grief involved with that. But no matter what we're studying, all the different things, like I will ask you, has the population increased in a community that you've, you're studying or is it decreasing and why? What's the social problems that are involved in that? And so uh, it's important to know we're doing comparative systems. We're also not just comparing rural systems to rural systems. We're also comparing rural systems to suburban systems to county seats to, you know, there's all types of comparison that we measure and the way in which life uh, basically continues to, to develop and sustain. Finally, T.L. Smith wrote one of the uh, core uh, sociological uh, books on rural sociology is actually just called the sociology of rural life after World War II, which is another thing we have to keep in mind. Things changed when we globalized. Things changed so much that rural life suddenly looked very different. And a lot of times um, the suburb, uh, which had not existed in quite the same way, became another factor in how it affected the life of rural uh, communities because people were building large uh, towns outside of cities that still felt small, had a small education uh, system and or could be a close commute to the city, which would emulate what you would often feel in a rural system. But many of the values were tied to the urban center rather than tied to the more mechanical society. And we'll talk about that in a second of the rural areas. So sociological facts then started to develop differently. Just because you're in a small town might not mean that you're in a rural community. Um, and derived from the study of relationships, you know, this is another thing we have to keep in mind is relationships changed. When we started to globalize, especially people are relying on their livelihoods, not only for local or national survival, but also understanding that they are part of a global system. And so um, relationships 
with the world are very different. And um, T. L. Smith talked a lot about how development on the global scale affected the development of our small rural communities. So last point is rural sociology studies relationships. Some aspects obviously intersect with other areas of science, including uh, anthropology, kinship systems, understanding tenure and farming systems. So one thing you'll notice if you are not a major that is a sociology major, that many things that might be in other areas or regions of study might pop up. Um, and please share those in the class, knowing that it is intersectional and all of this helps us define what's going on there. Of course, we in sociology, though, do determine a lot of what we study based on our method and our system. And Emil Durkheim was one of the founding thinkers who helped us understand different society based on division of labor and how labor affected our identity. He had other kinds of uh, studies as well. He's well known to uh, most sociologists for understanding social facts, but also things like the occurrence of suicide or the idea of times when they change, how that can sometimes take norms away from people's uh, everyday lives that if taken away too long, they feel a sense of normlessness. We are seeing this actually in our rural societies quite a bit. Um, but one of the neatest uh, concepts he really looked at is how people were glued together what created society and how was that society maintained based on what was going on in our brains and our patterns of life uh, that created a sense of normal rather than a sense of um, not being able to feel secure or belong. So mechanical solidarity and organic solidarity is how Durkheim defined the difference and how people found a sense of belonging based on the complex societies of each uh, type of life, whether you were part of a more small environment, a smaller community, which tended to be more rural, and organic, which was more urban and sometimes suburban. And we'll talk about that in just a second. I want to make sure to get clear about what it means to have solidarity. Solidarity is that bond of unity. And as said, it is the glue. It's that feeling inside that I belong to this community. And that's created with lots of different norms and rituals, such as, you know, our colors at ESU are gold and black. And we have Corky, who is our hornet. And those create common bonds and rituals about our life because those colors mean something to us. Well, in the same sense, solidarity is united around a common sense or goal against a common enemy. Now, if I bring up other colors of other Division II NCAA schools and their mascots, you might have a sense of us against them. And that's something solidarity often does is it creates an enemy. Now that can cause some issues, especially when we're talking in small regions and communities about how that affects our psyche and also affects what we do when we see uh, some, uh, some sort of threat. Um, but what is most understood in this symbolically is that they, people feel like they belong and they're unified. And often that is in rural societies around common types of labor, farming, ranching, some sort of manufacturing that might be on the rural sector some sort of mining, some sort of uh, working forest um, life, some sort of working um, mountain life. I mean, there's just so many ways in which all of these things create a bond because of common labor. Cohesion then is the state of cohering and working together to sustain everybody's role in this type of solidarity. Mechanical solidarity then is a social cohesion, which comes from homogeneity, sorry, um, of individuals. And that homogenous life means you're very alike. You have a lot of things in common. Plus you recognize different roles people play. In smaller societies, you don't have 500 hospital uh, attendants or surgeons to pick from if you wanna go get knee surgery. 
You may not even have one. You may have one in a county. Um, you may have a person that is a doctor in town, or you might have a dentist in town. You might have the local cafe in town or a couple locate, you know, there may be a ability to sustain a few, but that sense of a likeness is that everybody's built around that little tiny system surviving. People feel connected through similar work, educational and often religious training, meaning you often find a common goal about um, what belief means to people in these communities. And lifestyle is often important. You'll sometimes see people's clothing looking very similar or the way in which people speak, the type of food you eat. Mechanical society then is mostly about being alike. Organic society then is more the social cohesion based on dependence of individuals in larger systems. And it's more advanced societies. I don't like the word advanced, to be honest. I think rural, so sociolog or rural sociologists uh, fight this all the time because our combines these days can run themselves from a satellite. And is it more advanced to be more disconnected um, from that which is not right in front of you and just depend on it? So that's important to, to consider in your conversation. But I would say more intricate societies where we're not aware of every person and every role they play, but we depend on this invisible sense of security. And you can choose from lots of different uh, <coughs> doctors, for example, for knee surgery, but you have to look them up. You don't know them. You don't have a lot of reference a lot of the time. Um, and there's ways in which we just kind of get used to that and it seems normal. Most of our society has not been built around super large urban centers on the planet since its existence in humans' life on the planet. And so this is something that a lot of times we have to recognize we created when we started to develop situations where cities and policy uh, centers happened. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what happens a lot of the times is that if you are raised in communities of organic solidarity, a lot of the times you will assume that this has always been around and really we're developing um, cities and policy systems every day causing differences in how we've done it um, that are still quite new. Even suburban centers and college towns are developing very differently than they did a hundred years ago. And it's because we also have a globalized system. And so um, rural communities tend to still develop with a sense of connection to all of that, but still maintaining an identity that might historically have a memory of uh, likeness. And so that can cause some major issues, especially when we talk about new people coming into those communities and the effects that have on uh, that system. The last thing I want to lift up, as I almost choked to death, and I'm sorry about that, uh, is classification. Rural communities tend to, in the United States and other parts of the region, be up and against the definition of what it means to be urban. And the same is true in the United States Census, as we uh, take in information about communities, we tend to uh, obviously go to the places where the most population is uh, represented. represented. So on the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau, there's two types of urban areas that are identified. Urbanized areas, which are 50,000 or more people. You have a few of those in the state of Kansas, for example, but not a ton especially when you compare it to places on the East Coast or the West Coast or Texas, which have many places with more than 50,000 people in a community. Urban clusters, often seen as suburban areas, are at least 2,500 and less than 50,000 people. And so um, that is, for example, um, cities that are right outside of Kansas City or outside of Wichita that might fit into that are more of an urban cluster. Everything else that is not in those two are considered rural and it encompasses population housing territory not included in these two other areas. 
I think that's interesting and I'd be interested in what you think about that uh, when you uh, do your discussion board this week. <clears throat> so that's all I have for this week, but I want you to think what is rural sociology? What are we studying? How are we studying it? What is the importance of understanding mechanical society versus organic society? What are the different ways in which life has changed in rural communities? And <clears throat> what is it that uh, we can predict will happen in these rural communities um, as we understand the world changing in the face of globalization um, and as it continues to be a more connected world? If you have any questions, please feel free to text or call me at 913-553-0267. And also you can always email me at jamtodd, jtodd actually, at emporia.edu. I hope you have a great uh, week and I look forward to all the responses that I get to see as we learn more about the rural world we live in and the ways in which we uh, can see how it impacts all of us. Take care. <laughs>